Hello there, we're gonna get started. Um, welcome to the second fall reading in the Lunch Poem series. I'm the director, Jeffrey G. O'Brien. Um, Camille Considine can't be here today because she broke her ankle a couple of days ago. Um, so I hope we see her sooner rather than later, but she's gonna mend for a while. Um, before we start with our reading featuring Elisa Gonzalez, um, I just want to thank the people and institutions that support um, lunch poems, starting with Dr. and Mrs. Tom Colby and um, the library, of course, especially Amber Lawrence, who does so much to make these events happen, and um, Dean Geyer's office, as well as um, several poets in the English department. Um, Pegasus Books is here with copies of um, Elisa's debut volume, Grand Tour, um, and I believe you'd be willing to sign copies afterwards if people are interested. So please go over and check that out after hearing things from it. Um, and then I'll get up at the end and tell you about readings to come. Okay, so in Elisa Gonzalez's debut, Grand Tour, the third line of the second poem, titled After My Brother's Death, I Reflect on the Iliad, reads, quote, the building across from the cemetery calls itself life storage. I couldn't help when reading that but think of another elegiac poem concerned with where life can be stored, Frank O'Hara's A Step Away From Them, which contains the lines, first Bunny died, then John Latouche, then Jackson Pollock, but is the earth as full as life was full of them? and one has eaten and one walks past the magazines with nudes and the posters for bullfight and the Manhattan storage warehouse, which they'll soon tear down. O'Hara here is fairly confident that the immaterial poem is a superior container for the dead as compared with earth or magazines or posters or the structurally failing Manhattan storage warehouse. Gonzalez is, I think, more suspicious of poetry's powers to preserve, in part because elegy performs a working through of grief, whereas she wants, quote, to ensure my grief, um, to ensure my desire for grief is never satisfied, and wants, quote, the page itself to burn. This poem, like several others in the book, is less conventional elegy than an anti-elegiac elegy, which is no paradox but a living ongoing stance. The last poem in the book, Present Wonders, asserts that there is, quote, no elegy for the ongoing. And I think we should read ongoing there as referring both to those still living, but also the dead, their deaths, and the unpredictable visitations of grief. So this is a poet who prefers motion to the arresting function of any container. In an interview with the poet Maggie Milner for the Yale Review, Gonzalez confesses, quote, when I was going through copy edits for the book, I realized that I'd used the word enclose too many times, I think three or four, but I felt only one could probably survive. Instead of enclosure, the grand tour. Here, not only a passage through sites, crucial sites of experience like Cyprus, Warsaw, and um, Puerto Rico, but an ongoing passage through poetic modes as well, none of which can hold successfully or for long the eros or thanatos they survive to report. A poem called The Ice Storm ends, quote, there are several methods for disposing of the dead, but this volume's least peripatetic commitment is to not dispose of them entirely, um, to hold them while going on and the grief they have engendered because of the intimacy they have provided, which means keeping them without enclosing them decisively in the studied container of elegy. In a recent ekphrastic poem about an Edward Moybridge sequence, Gonzalez describes his project as about releasing motion from images shot to still, and may as well be describing um, her own productive, beautiful dissatisfaction with any verse that stills experience and its subjects. That desire to have the page burn knows that fundamentally heat is motion, a little tour that turns the fixity of the printed word into annihilating movement and returns us to the ongoing world. 
in it, please help me welcome Elisa Gonzalez. Thank you. Um, I really think that the best thing that can happen to a writer I have discovered in the time since my book came out is um, being read intelligently and thoughtfully. And that was so lovely as an interpretation of my work. Um, thank you all so much for being here in this lovely space. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm excited to read in this iconic series. That is not a word I use lightly. Um, since we're on a university campus, I guess, I'm going to begin with a, um, with a poem that does talk about education and the university. It's called Failed Essay on Privilege. I came from something popularly known as nothing. And in the coming, I got a lot. My parents didn't speak money, didn't speak college, still, I went to Yale. For a while, I tried to condemn. I wrote, let me introduce you to evil. Still, I was a guest there. I made myself at home. And I know a fine shoe when I see one. And I know to be sincerely sorry for those people's problems. I know to want nothing more than it would be so nice to have. And I confess I'll never hate what I've been given as much as I wish I could. Still, I thought I of all people understood Aristotle, what is and isn't the good life. Because, I wrote, privilege is an aggressive form of amnesia. I left a house with no heat. I left the habit of hunger. I left a room I shared with seven brothers and sisters I also left. Even the good is regrettable, or at least sometimes should be regretted. Yet to hate myself is not to absolve her. I paid so much for wisdom. And look at all of this. Look at all I have. Epistemology of the Shower. We were 13. R explained that her parents forbade her showering alone because she had been masturbating. She didn't use that word. I was lying on a blow-up mattress beside her bed, our habit on Saturday nights so together we could rise at seven and ready ourselves for church. This was why I would have to shower with her in the morning, a masturbation monitor. Each of us, she quoted, has a habitual sin. To offer some sin in return, I said, I think I might be a lesbian. I'd never met one as far as I knew. I knew the word, I thought I knew what it signified. How do you know, she asked, and through the dark I could hear her terror for my soul. I retracted, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I just hate men. My habitual sin, we already knew, was hating my father whose habitual sin was hitting me. Through the dark, I reached for my hand. I was 19 when I concluded that I was wrong, that the word I needed, insofar as a word confines desire, was bisexual, whose sound I loathe, no music. But at this party, there is music, a Greek song loud as in the center of the room, a man dances the Zebekiko. Wild cheers as he circles and circles a glass of red wine. To finish, he falls to his knees, picks up the glass with his teeth, tilts his head back. I dated that man for a while. I've seen him dance this dance. Tonight, I miss the finale. I'm out in the stairwell, kissing A, whose long auburn hair preserves my modesty as bliss destroys thought. But the next morning, in an unfamiliar bed, I do think of R's question, answerable only by the body. Like, I'd argue, faith. 
The faith that habitually tumbled the two of us to the sanctuary floor, overcome by the spirit. She kept her faith. She grew up to be a godly woman. I racked up habitual sins. I desired, desire, such knowledge from this world that if age one day empties my mind, I sometimes think I'd be grateful. Imagination, too, is old habit, assiduously maintained despite consequences. For instance, I can easily imagine damnation as I did in R's room, my hand in hers, the usual visions of hell, then the shock of sun, the shock of cold water, some boiler problem. We showered anyway, together as commanded. Shivering, wet, we slid our hands across each other's bodies for warmth, ostensibly. One pretext leads to another. I pretend not to understand the shower's workings so that it will help and then join. And then, and then, and then, I learned you can separate pleasure from disgrace, though it's hard to make a habit of pure happiness when there's so much to know. Um, as you can probably tell, I grew up in a pretty restricted environment. And um, I think I also, there are many things that I think you only realize after you look at your own words on the page. Um, but a lot of these poems have to do with um, what it is possible to, to do and to know and the kind of dangers and uh, liberations of knowledge. But certainly it is a double-edged sword. Um, a couple of the poems in this book are addressed to other version, versions of myself at other ages, 24, 13, etc. This one is called To My 24-Year-Old Self. Sometimes you feel more intimacy with the woman who lives in the apartment opposite, 20 years older, probably, though she looks barely 10, devoted to evading age than with anyone stroked or kissed or otherwise handled. You sit naked on the white sofa, lights on, looking into her home, lights on. She paints her toenails, watches a black and white film, Hitchcock maybe, there's a woman with a platinum chignon. She applies a green mask, a cream, a mystery ointment. When you meet an older woman who resembles her enough, you do the obvious thing. That woman says after, don't ever leave me. But when you report to your friends, you change her words to, don't ever forget me. Typical of us, the lie and the lie. Why couldn't you tell the truth? That's what I've come to ask. Not to her, to your friends. I can't remember why it embarrassed you. Was it that she was old enough not to bear her throat? Or was it shame at yourself for misunderstanding how well you were understood? It always comes back to knowledge with us, doesn't it? Maybe it doesn't matter. You'll think of this woman so often throughout the years that by some lights, you'll have kept your vow. Um, so the title of this book is definitely um, ironic um, and sincere at the same time, like so many things. Um, it is, you know, it is about movement, grand tour, and the movement of the kind of of the whole person through the world, and all of the many things that happen to you, whether or not you want them, those things to happen. Um, so, but there's also a lot of movement through place. Um, after college, I lived for a little while in Poland and in Cyprus and, you know, a few other places kind of stack up through the book. And um, I'm going to read a poem that's set in Poland now on a train. On the night train from Virańsk. 
On the night train from the Dinsk, before I learned that in Krakow, someone I love did not kill himself because I am on the night train from the Dinsk, I wander carriages hunting an open seat, at last settling for the corridor's cold floor. It's a cold October outside this rumbling and screaming contraption where I'm quick to shift aside for the blonde nun I disappoint by saying, no, I don't know where the toilet is or if it has paper, and where I jump up at the conductor's brusque pani proche. He cups his hand like my father beckoning for me to surrender whatever small thing I loved. But this man needs a second class ticket to validate my seat on the floor, my back against the cold wall, my hair tangled on a screw. On my knees, I prop the selfishness of others. Pusuprasham, I say to everyone angry at my body's inconvenience, everyone who passes, including the nun who returns rubbing germs between her palms. Forgive me that I have a body, a thought I've had many times. My father, who hates, hated my body, asks me to stand. No, it's the conductor talking again, as if we're new to each other, as I've greeted people whose nakedness I regret touching. Forgive the weakness of the mind confronting the shames of the body. I thank the conductor. I cover my face with the selfishness of others. I close my eyes. This is before. I am telling a story of before. Before I learned to purchase first class tickets to choose trains from this millennium, not this creaking and wailing artifact, where an old woman wraps the conductor's shin with her cane as she berates him for the lurch, the crush, assigning him sole responsibility for all of Poland's trains, which he refuses. Forgive me for the sins of others. That's not something people say if they can help it. This is before again. Before the nun disembarking at a town I recall only as fluorescence and the screech of brakes gives me her window seat for nothing I have done. The world becomes perfect in its repetition of vanishing. Flash of light, then dark again and again, signs of people I'll never meet. Many years before I arrived in Poland, I pictured myself wandering alone, away from my father's house not realizing I was a child and children are the most hopeful narcissists. That wandering happens alongside others. What else didn't I know? That I would love places glimpsed through dirty glass that now fondly I think of the couple splitting a ham sandwich mayonnaise smeared beside me and how suspiciously they regarded my hands. That I'd love that stupid sandwich, the dry, overheated air, the blushing ugliness of faces such as mine. The windows chill against my cheek. Even that, despite its comfort. The conductor who once again checks my ticket. When I was young, I believed that one loves only what deserves love. Forgive me, father, I said, that I am hateful. Glow of towns with names invisible passed by in a wheezing and roaring beast. Memory of childhood is a history of error. So I think on the night train from Gdańsk to Krakow, believing I am experienced enough in the deedal web of selfishness and love to pack the book away. Forgive me, he said, for even thinking about it. I thought about it before I thought about you finding my dead body. What else could I do but thank him? What else don't I know I've been spared? By others, by the faults of memory? The conductor taps my shoulder and the sandwich eaters call out in Polish then English to wake me. Pusaprasham, this is your station. Down the platform, a dark haired stranger approaches, listening to her own music ticket in hand. Did she take my place? I've wondered since. I wondered, forgive me, even as he was talking, confessing as much as he thought I could bear. Um, so one of the things that happened in real life um, is that a few years ago, um, almost exactly three years ago, my brother, my youngest brother died. I'm the oldest of eight. And um, 
that really did change my life, obviously. It is a new one now. And the way that, um, you know, before Jeffrey had so, I think, beautifully described the relationship of elegy and ongoingness is very much something I am thinking about in these poems. Even ones which are maybe most explicitly uh, not elegiac are very much in the shadow of um, death that must be reckoned with and lived through. After my brother's death, I reflect on the Iliad. The water cuts out while shampoo still clogs my hair. The nurse who swabs my nose hopes I don't have the virus. It's a bitch. The building across from the cemetery calls itself life storage. My little brother was shot, I tell the barista who asks how things have been and tip extra for her inconvenience. We speak only to the dead, someone tells me. To comfort, I assume, or inspire. But I take it literally as I am wont, even my shut up and fuck and let's cook tonight. Those are for you, Stephen. You won't come to me in my dreams so I must communicate by other avenues. A friend sends an image from Cy Twombly's 50 Days at Ilium, a red bloom, the words, like a fire that consumes all before it, and asks, have you seen this? It's at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. If I have, I can't remember, though I did visit with you when you were 11 or 12, when you tripped silent alarm after silent alarm, skating out of each room as guards jostled in, and I, though charged with keeping you from trouble, joined the game, and the whole time we never laughed, not till we were released into the grand air we couldn't touch and could. You are dead at 22. As I rinse dishes, fumble for keys, buy kale and radishes, in my ear, Prime repeats, I have kissed the hand of the man who killed my son. Would I do that? I ask as I pass the store labeled signs, signs. I've studied the mugshot of the man who killed you. I can imagine his hands. Of course I would, each finger even, to hold your body again and to resurrect you who knows what I am capable of, if I were. Nights, I replay news footage, your blood on asphalt, sheen behind caution tape. Homer's similes, I've been told, are holes cut in the cloth between the world of war and another more peaceful world. On rereading, I find even there a man kills his neighbor Let Achilles cut me down as soon as I have taken my son into my arms and have satisfied my desire for grief. This, my mind's new refrain, in the pharmacy queue, in the train's rattling frame. The same friend and I discuss a line by Zbigniew Herbert, where a distant fire is burning, like a page of the Iliad. It's nearly an ontological question, my friend says, the instability of reference, the fires in the pages of the poem, the literal page set afire. We see double. You are the boy in the museum. You are the body consumed ash. Alone in a London museum, I saw a watercolor of twin flames, one black, one a gauzy red only to learn the title is Boats at Sea. It's like how sometimes I forget you're gone. But it's not like that, is it? Not at all. When in this world, similes carry us nowhere. And now I see again the boy pelting through those galleries, a boy not you, a flash of red, red, chasing or being chased, or did I invent him? Mischief companion, brother, Listen to me plead for your life, though even in the dream I know you're already dead. 
How do I ensure my desire for grief is never satisfied? Was Priam's ever? I tell my friend I want the page itself to burn. Hmm. Um, while we are on the rich theme of death, I will read another poem uh, that is um, an attempt at an elegy for a friend who in Cyprus who died in 2020. And this is called Notes Toward an Elegy. The Cypriot son is impatient, a woman undressed who can't spare the time to dress, so light like a vitrine holds even a storm. One day in the old city, a pineapple rain and I'm on my way home from the pharmacy, carrying my little bag of cures. Refuge at the cafe in the nameless square. Nihal brings espresso poured over ice, turns off the music. We listen to rain fall through the light until the end. White wine greening in a glass, lion rampant in the sky. Moon reclined gorgeous in her silver shift. Polished newels, door askew in its frame. Hot mornings, hot apple tea honeyed. The mountains of fist knuckled on the horizon. Dust is coming, dust is not yet here. Whenever her hands dance, I tell her how beautiful she says there's so much other movement I do not perceive, and I accept the presence of dances invisible to me. Figs in the tree, figs on the stones, the stains of rotting fruit spread and shadow at the sun's whim, that steady dissolution of body into form that signals the progress of a masterpiece. Copper bowl in her hands, in the bowl in the hands, olive leaves burn. I ask her to read to me. I like the way her voice handles words. What will she read? First, she laughs. It's a good day to laugh. The coffee is strong and the light. Why read when we can talk, when all our friends are here? My perversity is silence, a shudder stopped in the throat when all the time I hear her voice, I am glad my soul met your soul. Examples of what I do not know. It's just that for a time I took love out walking with me everywhere. And sometimes I thought, child, whose is this child when it played in the square? A sunshine creature, terrifying. Yet still, I looked at it like I've never looked at a stranger who promises water to the waterless for nothing. And now I lie awake, pretending everyone in the world lies still the way the living are still. Not entirely, never entirely. I have a few more for you. Really, only a couple. Um, this is the last poem in the book called Present Wonders. Present Wonders. That morning light from two large uncurtained windows doesn't correct my sleepy eyes. They stay small, stupid, and grumpy. That nonetheless, the rest of me moves that it's accident that the light and I touch my desk at the same time, that the light doesn't have hands. It seems like it should. It draws shapes the way hands do. That I'm not dreaming because in dreams I can never talk. And today my mouth is so dry I try infant sounds for elemental needs, wa for water, etc. That my fingers miss the keys that suffering is often speechless, sometimes soundless, and yet we understand it exists in the absence, too. And yet, have I ever not been shocked at pain, 
like a toddler falling down. That there's no elegy for the ongoing. When elegy travels from lament to solace, to return us from grief to life, to strip us from the dead. Not yet, not yet. To honor suffering when honor puts gravestones where no body is, hides bodies where no gravestones are. Well, I can't. That I used to speak as a whole being without doubt, or do I misremember? I tend to brighten the past, shadow the present, which is shadowed, don't mistake. That I am angry, though powerless, like a child? Well, then today I am a child. And with a child's voice deepened by some form of progress, I ask for water. The same cadence, the same intonations, insistent and afraid, because all lack in childhood feels forever. A fever thirst, a mother leaving for her job at the grocery store, a door locked to keep you safe small fists against the cold door. That they didn't break it down, that they bled, that they hurt only later and now, not in a dream, but in silence. A pain like light against a wall, or just against. Um, I'm going to read two more poems. And thank you for coming to this. This um, is another poem addressed to my self. Um, it's about <laughs> the problem of writing. To my 30-year-old self. In two years, you'll forget how old you are. Subtract a year from yourself. That's age. That's hope. Someone will correct this error. You'll hate them. You excel at hating. You excel at untrammeled feelings, mostly ugly, though also generosity and sacrifice, which can, at times, make ugly things happen. I'm afraid I can't explain why you failed your younger versions, just as I've failed you when we all agreed on the great project of our life, to write well. Not well, I can hear you thinking, to write perfectly. If I answer, that's impossible, that was never possible, you'll turn away, enraged at your own mind, Another nightmare after another. It's like you're my sister. I still cherish you. A woman so relentless in stupidity and pursuit. Like a dumb dog. Like you at 12 and 2 and 21. Remember writing that first story? It was terrible. Immediately, you wrote another. That's hope. I think I remember. We were six. We had no judgment, only promise. Um, this last poem is called um, Roman Triptych. And, uh, you know, I um, discovered after titling the poem and uh, getting fairly far along in the book process that that title is also the title of the only poem that Pope John Paul II ever wrote, um, which is published as a book-length poem in Italian and probably every other language in the world. But um, anyway, so now I feel that this poem is vaguely blasphemous and that pleases me. But <laughs> Roman triptych. One, red stones piled in square towers Red roads cruise aqueducts. Blue chain by the door strikes a bell. From our gold-draped room, the windows with their astragals and sashes glass out the bottle green hills. I hold her naked on the carpet, my body spilling out of my lavender dress. Body, if you could be forever spilling out of your lavender dress. Two. 
twin redheads fondle twin Barbies, sliding sateen dresses on and off the doll's voluptuous physiques. I tread on a grate and in a cloud of vertiginous steam, see in a store window my hands disappearing under a mannequin's skirt. The noise of a drill down the avenue, like whipped cream shooting from a can. Three. My hair tangles her fingers till I unknot it, and I unknot it as I've done many things to detach myself from pleasure. She says the words I use remind her that she is reading a poem, referring to the above vertiginous. Reader, I want you to know you are reading a poem. What is the point of talking otherwise? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eliza, for that musical thought. Um, please remember that Pegasus is here with copies of Elisa's book. Please go consider it, maybe even retire it from the marketplace and talk to Elisa. And please come back on December 5th. We're skipping November for our very own um, John Shopta. See you then. Thank you. <laughs>